Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is September 17th, 2015, and my guest is Pete Geddes. Pete is a managing director of the American Prairie Prairie Reserve. Pete, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks, Russ. Pleasure to be here. Now, I mentioned the American Prairie Reserve earlier this year in the episode with Summer Brennan when I was talking about national parks and wilderness, and it's a very different model. Uh, tell us about it. It is a very different model. What we're trying to do in uh, northeastern Montana, in one of the last four places of the world where tempered grasslands still exist in an intact state, meaning they haven't been plowed uh, up and converted into agricultural crops, and there's still a lot of it. It's a big there are big landscapes, is put together some semblance of what Lewis and Clark witnessed some 200 years ago when they came through the place. And what they saw as they paddled their boats up the Missouri River was a wildlife, a cornucopia of wildlife that they saw nowhere else on their 4,000-mile round trip from St. Louis to the Pacific and back. And the reason we're working in northeastern Montana is because there is a large amount of land already in federal public ownership. This is a result of the failure of homesteaders in the early and mid uh, 20th century, uh, late 19th, early mid 20th century. They tried to settle this land, which is very remote and rugged, and couldn't. So the land reverted back into the federal estate. And also we're working in a place where people have been leaving for a very, very long time, about 10% population decline per decade since the First World War. So our job is to buy half a million 500,000 private acres that knit together this complex of land already in federal ownership. And the goal is what size when you're done? The goal is to be about one and a half times larger than Yellowstone National Park. So our uh, charge is to try to put together a complex of land that's three and a half million acres in size. That will be a mix of private lands that we own outright, of lands that we lease from the federal government, the Bureau of Land Management, of lands that butt right up against the uh, Charlie Russell National Wildlife Refuge, which is managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and some state of Montana sections, which we also uh, lease. And for those um, who are not acreage friendly, three and a half, it's about three and a third million acres, which I understand is about the size of the state of Connecticut. Roughly the size of the state of Connecticut. And the idea is over time, this landscape becomes blended. And what we mean by that is fences go down and animals and people move across it without regard to what property they're on. So they move from Fish and Wildlife Service land to our private land, to our lease land, to the federal lands managed by the Bureau of Land Management. And it becomes one seamless landscape where you can get some semblance of the great animal migrations that happened about 200 years ago. So bison, pronghorn, antelope, elk are all moving around like they used to do. Currently, the numbers of those animals are quite low uh, as compared to their historic abundance. And in theory, an animal will not, because those fences will be down, and also ideally, I assume, because the way it will be managed, uh, uh, a migrating elk will not say, well, I'm on or of land management land, now i got to be careful. In theory, there'd be no visual or management difference for the – certainly for the animals, uh, possibly though for the people. We'll yeah, that's we'll talk exactly about that. right. But the animals, it should be – the seamless part is that animals can move freely in this area uh, the way they, in theory, can move freely in, say, Yellowstone National Park. They don't have to worry about being shot or yeah, uh, that, fenced or whatever. It. Yeah, that's exactly right, and we can do that now. In fact, uh, a group of us just finished a 250-mile transect from the west of our properties to the east, moving entirely from our private land through the various uh, public land ownerships. So even today, you can get out on this landscape and experience this sense of openness that you can't get in very many other places. And as we add more properties and knit them together over time, that feeling of continuity on the landscape just increases. And describe what it's like a little bit on that 250-mile uh, trip. I, I've seen a lot of videos. They're really beautiful. 
Uh, I have to say one of the things that strikes me about the videos is that most of the land, it being a prairie, is pretty flat, which is not necessarily the most interesting visual space. So tell me what was exciting or pleasant or boring about walking 250 miles through this region. Yeah, this is a, this is a landscape that is not uh, anything like the iconic Western landscapes that most of your listeners are going to be familiar with. So it's not like Yellowstone or Yosemite or Glacier National Park. Those protected areas were put aside basically for their geologic value. They were uh, incredibly beautiful to the first people who saw them. So there is a real aesthetic sense of why we should protect these areas. The prairie, on the other hand, is, in, is a place capable of supporting a huge amount of biodiversity. These grasslands are incredibly rich in their ability to provide forage for all sorts of animals. Unlike the prairies people may be thinking of in Iowa and Kansas and Nebraska, our prairies are classified as uh, sagebrush steppe. So they're very high and cold. The grasses grow very low, nothing much above uh, your ankle boots except for the sagebrush. And it's a mix of flat, high plateau lands, and we're in the Missouri River Breaks country. So very highly eroded, incised creek drainages with timber at the higher elevations. Very hot in the summertime, quite cold and windy in the winter. Not a lot of snow that sticks in a snowpack, but a lot of snow that blows around. This is uh, Montana is one of the most remote states in the lower 48 in terms of its isolation from major markets. And this is one of the remote places in the most remote state. So it's way out there. It's a five and a half hour drive from where I live in Bozeman and uh, about an hour and a half in a Cessna 180 going 150 miles an hour or so. Uh, the, the videos have lots of really cool animals in them. I'm a big fan of animals. And I have to say, when you started talking about uh, Lewis and Clark and trying to create the experience that something like what they had when they saw the abundance, I got goosebumps. Um, and that's uh, partly from reading Stephen Ambrose's book on it, uh, on the Lewis and Clark trip, which which does capture that spectacular, the cornucopia you mentioned. But you said right now there's not much there or there's relatively, it's certainly not close to what it could hold. Why is that? And give there's us a flavor of... You know, the size, say, of the bison herd now and or the elk herd or the elk population, what you hope to have. Yeah, that's a very uh, good question and a little bit complicated. So uh, just interrupt me if I'm not making uh, making it clear to your listeners how this all works. We have a bison herd of 600 animals right now on our deeded property. They're classified by the state of Montana as domestic cattle, so we can continue to grow that herd as large as we want, making sure that we have enough grass for them so we're not doing damage to the resource. The rest of the wildlife, the rest of the animals in the state of Montana, including grizzly bears and um, wolves, are classified as wildlife by the state and are managed by the state fish, wildlife, and parks. The tolerance for increasing wildlife numbers is uh, completely a sociological phenomenon. It has very little to do in our area with biology or ecology. It has everything to do with tolerance from ranchers to uh, have wildlife on their lands. Currently, most ranchers view wildlife only as a cost. So for example, uh, elk herds run through their fences, get into their alfalfa hay fields. It's nothing but a nuisance. It hits their uh, bottom line. So one of our challenges that we started um, with this Wild Sky Beef program that we'll talk about a little bit later is to address the sociology of this and decrease, increase what we call the social carrying capacity for wildlife. We need to flip that incentive around so that our neighbors who are going to be uh, within and around the reserve for a very long time because they want to be cattle ranchers and they have no interest in selling land to us, we need them to see wildlife as a benefit to receive an economic benefit from our conservation project. That really is the ultimate lever that will allow us to raise wildlife numbers to some semblance of what they were uh, 200 years ago. So give us some kind of – maybe you don't have these numbers. You don't know what they're going to be, but the bison herd is 600 now. How, and how many how many antelope do you think there are in the lands that we're talking about right now? Is it 1,000? Yeah, yeah, is it 10,000? Because I have no idea. Right. So uh, I'll just run through three big um, animals that uh, a lot of your listeners are going to be familiar with. So the bison herd 
It is currently at 600. Those are our bison. We own them. Our goal is to get to 10,000. Historically, we think in the three and a half million acres in which we're operating, there were probably uh, 50 to 70,000 animals on a permanent basis moving around these grasslands. Remember, they were hugely migratory animals. Pronghorn antelope in the area are currently in the low to mid hundreds. Our goal is to have uh, tens of thousands of them. Elk number currently about 3,500 animals. And again, our goal is to get them up into the 10 to 15,000 range. Historically, you had many tens of thousands of those two animals out on the prairie moving around. Pronghorn antelope, just for your listeners, have the largest land migration in North America. They start out in the fall, right about now, moving down from the Canadian prairie provinces. They'll get uh, come right through the American Prairie Reserve, and by late fall, early winter, they'll be down south of the Missouri River into uh, southern Montana and parts of northern Wyoming, uh, a migration of some 400 miles that comes squarely through the land uh, that we have managed. So these animals are capable of moving great distances. And again, the reason why we're going so big from a land perspective is those animals need that much space to move around in some sort of semblance of a natural natural state. Is it enough? I mean, it's big, but is it big enough? It is uh, what the conservation biologists have told us we need is a minimum size. And then, of course, all this is overlaid with what you can actually do practically. There are places in the country where conservation at this kind of scale is just frankly impossible. So you've been out to the Bozeman area and know how popular and how fast growing it is. The cost of getting uh, the, the land is just too great. So again, northeastern Montana is a place that has had fewer people today than when Frederick Jackson Turner wrote the closing of the American frontier, I think in 1876, wow. Mo- way fewer than uh, less than one person per square mile. So you've got to pick places for conservation where A, you have the right habitat conditions, B, you have uh, the, you know, the right sociology, the right demographics, I guess. So that it's not a place that's getting an influx of people, but rather an outflux of people. And uh, C, where you can actually afford to buy the land. So you mentioned three relatively friendly animals. Uh, I'm a little bit unclear about bison, but uh, pronghorn, pronghorn antelope and uh, elk are, they don't do a lot of, um, they do a lot of damage to people. They don't have incisors. To people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're not, they're, they can be tough on the grass, as, as uh, maybe we'll talk about in other places. But mm-hmm. um, what about a little more um, visceral animals, uh, wolves or bear? What do you expect in fox and coyote? What, what do you expect in, that, in those areas? Yeah, so our project is all about the entire suite of native biodiversity. So we would like everything back on our lands. That includes the top predators, grizzly bears, uh, wolves. Uh, we already have a lot of coyotes out on the land. Uh, Swift fox, which is a, a small little predator about the size of a lap dog, which uh, we're working actively to reintroduce. And what's important for your listeners to understand is we do not control those animals. They're, they're the property of the state. And we can't go down to Yellowstone, for example, and load a bunch of wolves in the back of a pickup truck and drive them up to our area. So our job is to make sure that this landscape is put together big enough and that we've done enough good work on the sociology such that when wolves do appear and they're about there's a pack about 120 miles away and wolves are fantastic dispersers uh they'll be there in our area you know soon in the next 3 to 5 years grizzly bears are coming out of the rocky mountain front down on the plains where they used to be in ever greater numbers uh that they're they're a little bit further away and that's a harder journey for them to make cuz they're big animals and they have to get up across an interstate highway but really the key is for us to get ahead of the sociology so when our neighbors in five or seven years see a wolf running across their pasture they're reaching for binoculars rather than a 30 30 yeah i hear you so let's talk a little bit about that sociology and let's talk about wild sky beef which you mentioned briefly uh, a minute ago it's a very creative idea and you're also involved with that directly talk about what it is uh what's your role and how's it doing yeah, so again, this uh, the key thing to growing wildlife numbers, and this is not unique to our project, uh, it in fact happens all around the world, is to minimize human conflict. And in most places, uh, people view wildlife as a cost rather than an economic benefit. 
uh, six or seven years ago, our members of our team were over in Africa and they were traveling around to various camps and they came to one in Namibia where the uh, uh, wildlife park, their parks over there, game parks, had figured out a way to live with cheetahs and uh, make the uh, local communities the beneficiaries of having cheetahs on their land rather than uh, the enemies of that. This is not a, not a particularly new or original story. There are all sorts of work that's been done in Africa over the last 20 years to try to flip this dynamic. So we, we imported those ideas back to the American Prairie Reserve and we formed, we bought a beef company. Uh, some of our critics think we're anti-cows, but we actually own a cattle company. And the idea is neighboring ranchers who want to participate in our Wild Sky Beef program in exchange for operating their livestock in a more wildlife friendly way. And we have a whole list of things they have to do and third party audits and all that kind of stuff. We pay them a premium for their cattle when we buy them in the fall or in the spring. And it's kind of like a frequent flyer program at Delta United. You can be silver, gold, diamond, platinum, mm. medallion, whatever it is. And as you move up that frequent flyer status, that means you're more tolerant of wildlife. So at the top of the food chain is you agree to, to have grizzly bears on your property and the amount of money that you get for going ever higher in your frequent flyer status increases over time. And again, this is uh, an attempt to, at first it recognizes that we're going to have holdouts within the American Prairie Reserve for a very long time. We're going to have people on the periphery who are going to be cattle ranchers. Indeed, we're going to be surrounded by about half a million head of cows when we're completely finished. We've got to make things go well for those people. So we need to figure out a way where we don't compromise on the biodiversity values that we want. And again, so that people see our wildlife, our wildlife that's spilling over from the reserve onto their land as a benefit rather than a cost. Wild Sky is just the first uh, of what will likely be very many things that we come up with. And again, instead of selling soap or shampoo or coffee, we tried to, we picked a business that fits with the local culture that uh, recognizes that there are people who love being cowboys and cowgirls and they will for a very, very long time. So trying to figure out a way to make things fit with the local culture and for these ranchers to see economic benefit. So give me the logistics again. So let's say I'm a rancher on the edge of the American Prairie Reserve and so I have committed, let's say, you said to at the top, I might be willing to let grizzly bears go across my property. I assumed it, there are certain restrictions on how much fencing I can have, if any. What, what's going? What's keeping my cows in? What, what What's the fencing issue for if I'm going to be conservation friendly? Yeah, very good question. Fencing is a huge, huge issue, and we uh, have something we call wildlife friendly fencing. So uh, in our neck of the woods, everything are barbed wire, four-strand fences. Uh, our wildlife-friendly fences have a smooth wire on the top that's quite low, 42 inches, so elk and deer can go over. And on the bottom, it has another smooth wire that's 18 inches off the ground because pronghorn antelope don't jump over fences. They go underneath them, and if you have a low wire that's barbed, it rips up their back, and they are prone to infection. And worse, in the winter when they get blown by the storms, if they can't get through these fences, they just uh, literally stand there and starve to death. Uh, on the landscape. So if you're a wildlife, uh, if you're a wild sky rancher and you're in the program, there are three things that you have to do to comply. Uh, one is you've got to allow us reasonable access to inspect um, your property to see if you do what you say you're going to do. Two, you can't shoot prairie dogs. Prairie dogs are a keystone species and we're trying to get them back in quite large numbers. And three, you can't plow native prairie. You may come to us as, as when our team goes up there and we're having coffee talking about what you'd like to do in the next year. And you say, I've got six miles of fence that needs replacing. So the Wild Sky program would immediately offer to help you replace that fence with wildlife friendly fencing so that uh, you are not uh, burdened with the cost of of putting up a new fence and you're not putting up a new fence that may last for very very long time, decades in some cases, that's not very friendly to wildlife moving through it. So I think I've mentioned uh, I, on this program before that I live in suburban Maryland and we have deer that run around and eat everything. Some of us think it's they're kind of charming and beautiful. I saw uh, a deer in my front yard uh, in the last week, actually, with a nice set of antlers. It was I thought I got kind of a thrill out of it, but for a lot of people, it's uh, an enormous. They say it was vermin. <laughs> 
And I think about, we have a beautiful botanical garden nearby, about five, 10 miles, and they have a special uh, enormous fence. And then they have where the cars come in, there's a special grating on the mm-hmm. road to keep animals from coming mm-hmm. deer yeah. from coming in. This is sort of the opposite. This is like a freeway. We're trying to encourage traffic and travel. So, so I'm a rancher. I may have some, you know, I have some affection for the land, but I also care about my pocketbook. Mm-hmm. And I don't like to see my cattle killed. So how or my grass eaten up? So how am I gonna? Why? Is, so what's the what's in it for me? So you. you Again, so the, the uh, again, so uh, you're you're a wild sky rancher, Russ, and uh, immediately you're going to receive a premium, something like three cents a pound, for just being in the program and doing the bare minimum. And as you decide to uh, do more, so for example, we have uh, one rancher who said, uh, "How about?" Uh, or we said to him, "How about we put uh, his ranches in a particularly important wildlife corridor? How about we stick a bunch of camera traps on your fences?" And for every picture of a cougar or uh, uh, a bear or a coyote or even a wolf that we find, we're, we'll pay you 250 bucks a photo. And I sent you two of those photos that we just uh, got in these yeah, camera beautiful. traps. And you, you post them online. Yeah, just fantastic. He said, sure, I'd love to do that. Uh, he was, this rancher was just over the top thrilled to know that these animals were on his land and he runs a cattle operation and not bothering his cows. Um, so once you get an appreciation as a landowner that these uh, these predators, which they are for sure, can be on your landscape and you can operate uh, not from a fear-based perspective, but one where you can um, – you know, value and appreciate the wildlife that is on your property that you may never, ever see. It sort of changes the psychology and the dynamic. Important for your listeners to know, if that mountain lion went and killed one of his cows, we wouldn't pay him compensation for that. They're already getting compensation up front in terms of a premium for their beef that we buy and then we sell to, you know, places like Whole Foods and and very high-end restaurants uh, all over the country. So that's going. Yeah, I just want to make get that make that clear. That's going right now. So if I'm a rancher in the program, right now you're buying my cattle, and I have to raise it. I assume in a certain way, also not just mm-hmm. it's not just a fence. No thing. hormones. Yep, no hormones. None of that kind of stuff. Clean cattle. Or uh, we've got. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, we we have four uh, four ranchers in the program right now, and again, the idea from uh, about starting this company is. All this stuff that happens, all the wildlife incentive programs, like the cameras and the wildlife-friendly fences and the guard dogs we buy for people and all those kinds of things, is supported by this independent company. So I'm in charge of the fundraising for the organization. I don't have to get on an airplane and fundraise for this program. We have a a business that we hope is ever more profitable for year profit. after year. For profit, uh, an LLC that uh, the American Prairie Reserve owns. Um, so that's out there running. We've, we've got what we call the, the meatheads for people in, in one corner office in our larger office in Bozeman. And that's what they do all day is they sell beef all around the country. So, uh, you can find the product, uh, pretty soon in the Washington DC area. We'll have a distributor there, but in New York, San Francisco, LA, Seattle, Portland, all over the country. And, and again, the story that comes with the product is, by the your your purchase of this uh, wild sky beef, you're supporting this wildlife friendly ranching and this fantastic conservation project in northern Montana. So, give me an idea of the scope of it right now. I have four ranchers. Doesn't sound like a lot, but they no, can have a lot. Of, a lot. They can have a lot of cows. Yeah, it's uh, in indeed. What we have to do is be really, really careful that the business works. So we can't grow the number of ranchers ahead of the profitability of the business. And we're really in the, and just finishing up our first year of getting this up and off the ground. We hope in three to five years to have 15 or 20 ranchers. Just uh, for example, in uh, last month that closed, we sold uh, $240,000 worth of beef at about 11% gross margin. So this is stuff that uh, the business is going and we're trying to grow it as fast as we can. Hugely complicated, hugely competitive uh, business. It's been fantastic for me. As you know, I spent 15 years doing academic think tank kind of stuff, being involved in a day-to-day business operation that I knew absolutely zero about until two years ago <laughs> has been fascinating. And that's one of the reasons why we bought 
bought a beef company. We bought the people that came along with it because, sure. uh, you know, I like my beef medium rare. Yep. That's about as much as I know about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so four ranchers, but I've looked at the maps. Um, we're talking about a three million acre project that's the way it's described in one of the videos I saw. It's surrounded by ranchers. So mm -hmm. do we need to get to 40, 400, 4,000 ultimately to make this friendly on the – because the issue is, just to come back to what you said earlier, make sure I got this right. The issue is if these migrating antelope end up attracting a much larger wolf population or grizzly population – then there's going to be more – some of them are going to stray into the ranching absolutely. parts. They're going to kill them. They're going to yeah, kill cattle. Uh, the ranchers are going to go to the state house, complain, and mm -hmm. threaten the, the viability of the program. Yeah, absolutely. That's the that's the key again. It's a sociology problem. And maybe for your listeners, if uh, they can all put a, get a mental map of Yellowstone, which is a rectilinear park, mostly in Wyoming, with a little bit in Montana, it's uh, got very hard uh, borders. It's essentially a big square. And what happens now? I'm sure many of your listeners are aware. Every spring, bison wander out of that park, and it's a very very hard boundary. And what I mean by that is one of two things happen to bison and wolves. As they move out of Yellowstone, they either get hazed back in, people on horseback or ATVs or even helicopters, or they get shot. What we want when our project is completed, and it's a little bit hard to know exactly how many numbers of Wild Sky Ranchers we're going to need because we don't know exactly what the project is going to look like at this stage. Because remember, we're buying properties to come on the market. So that's uh, never clear exactly where those properties come up. We want a soft boundary, exactly the opposite of what you get in Yellowstone, so that when those animals do spill over the boundaries, again, they're met with some level of tolerance. Now, we're not Pollyannish about this. We know that there are people who are never going to tolerate large carnivores on their property, and we're not suggesting that you know people should uh, you know have their children out in the backyard playing if grizzly bears or wolves are running around. Of course not. But what we're trying to do where we can at the margins is to increase the tolerance for wildlife, which should let those wildlife numbers grow. And in Montana, uh, your voice as a landowner is extremely important, important with the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks uh, department who manages wildlife. So as we become an ever bigger landowner at all these meetings, we stick our hand up and say, you know, uh, your target for elk in this area is 3,500. We really like it to be uh, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand, and uh, we've got no problem with elk on our land. We do this right now, and in those meetings, uh, our reserve team after the meetings uh, goes and talks to the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and they say, well, you've got a neighboring landowner who's really given us a hard time about elk. How Can you help us with this landowner? And we say, of course. And so immediately we go over and we start to talk about this landowner. What exactly is your problem? Turns out his problem is he's got a couple hundred head of elk in his alfalfa in late August. So we say, well, how about you let those elk eat your alfalfa hay and we'll buy you hay all winter long. So those are the conversations that we're just starting to have that, again, try to flip this dynamic from wildlife as a cost to wildlife as a benefit, thereby allowing us to grow these numbers back up. And ideally, you're going to try to buy as much of this land directly as you can. Yeah, that's a private property model, willing willing seller, willing buyer, obviously, and that just gives us a fantastic degree of control. So fire is a force that's been absent from most Western ecosystems for a long time. Well, this summer it's reasserting itself in spades, but particularly on the prairie, fire was a very important dynamic force for ecosystem rejuvenation. And on our diesel land, we can reintroduce fire and burn some of the acres to to generate a real heterogeneity of the landscape, we want short grass, tall grass, all sorts of, uh, you know, a very shaggy landscape. And three years ago, we burned just under a thousand acres and we have a fire management plan. And we can do that where we own a property. We, we need to be responsible about it, of course, and, and work with agencies and neighbors to let them know what's going on. And we can't burn down people's fences. But the private property aspect just allows us to move very quickly and very creatively yeah. across a whole, a whole host of issues uh two quick questions and i want to uh change shift gears a little bit one is uh how are you going to know if somebody's shooting prairie dogs <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, you're, you're not, uh, uh, I guess essentially, um, you know, we can uh, see if the prairie dog towns are growing over time. If, uh, if a rancher has a prairie dog town, we'll go out and map it with GPS. And if we see shrinkage over time, uh, rather than growth over time, we'll pay more attention to that. But, you know, this is a huge landscape that we operate on. Uh, several of our properties, maybe you can throw out that, that map I sent you up on the website as well, are the size of national park units. So, for example, Wind Cave National Park, we have uh, three or four properties that are larger than that. So this is, uh, this is an area where you need to have trust and cooperation and uh, really, really solid, strong relationships to, to make this go. That's my other question, which is you say if you have some very large property already, and if you look at the map, it's uh, it's a patchwork. Some of it's contiguous. Um, you're building off of some wildlife refuge that's already, you know, pres- somewhat pristine, presumably. Um, how far along are you toward your 3.3 million goal acre um, goal? Let's see. So a, a better way to to measure that is 500,000 private acres is a goal. And those 500,000 private acres are going to come with leases on the surrounding federal public land. So on that map, when you put it on the website, your listeners are going to see dark blue, which we own and see simple title linked to a light blue, which are lands that we lease from the federal government. We have just over 65,000 of those deeded acres out of the 500,000 goal so far. And I would say we're very early in the project. We have uh, that map that everybody will see represents 17 land deals that we've done over time. There's no shortage of land to buy. There's just shortage of money to buy it with. So that's really uh, the critical factor. There's no reason to think that the pace of land acquisition is going to drop off. And again, we'll buy properties uh, that may look disparate and sort of outlying and sell them at a later time to buy something that's closer in. Uh, and that matrix that you see that looks fragmented over time is going to invert and you will see it as a much more blended, contiguous landscape. And again, already it's, it's hard for people to get a sense of the scale out here, but some of these properties are as big as national park units. It's just uh, amazing uh, to get out on this land and experience the size and the scale of uh, what we've got going on. So I want to turn to some of the management issues. Um that are going to arise. And, and in particular, I want to, I want to try to, it's not so easy because this is in many ways, it's a hybrid project of public, private, it's private parts, public, private, private, private. Um, it's fascinating, but I want to read an excerpt uh, from a book that I've, I've mentioned many, many times over the course of the last few months. And those of you who are listening are probably some of you are maybe playing a drinking game where every time I say the word prairie, uh, you drink because I've, I've become so uh, fascinated by the prairie as a metaphor for emergent order and how some things have to grow and emerge in an organic way. And I've referenced this book. It's by Shauna Brown and Kathleen Eisenhart. It's called Competing on the Edge. It's actually a management book. It's not about emergent order per se, and it's not about uh, wildlife or prairies literally, but they use the prairie as a metaphor, and I, I find it provocative. So I'm going to read a, a somewhat lengthy excerpt. And I want, I want to try to get uh, – talk to, to uh, Kathleen Eisenhardt about this, try to get a PDF of this up on the web so you can read it at your leisure. But I wanted to read part of it because I think it highlights – besides the fact that I think it's intellectually uh, wonderful, uh, I think it's also a um, – it raises obvious issues for your project. So uh, this is, uh, again, from Competing on the Edge, and it starts off – they're talking about O'Hare Airport, and then they say the following. Everybody, you know, O'Hare Airport's a very – Busy airport. Here's the quote. Imagine yourself at O'Hare at a far different time, not in 1998, but in 1898 or even in 1798 before the patchwork quilt of roads, fences and farms had changed the Midwestern landscape forever. Around you would be an abundance of plants, long grasses of various colors, a palette of flowers, some trees. You'd see the original amber waves of grain. If you waited a little while, you'd also see a variety of animals going about their daily ritual. You would be enjoying a living, breathing prairie that stretched a thousand miles to the Rocky Mountains. It's an ecological system that today is virtually extinct. Suppose you were given the task of recreating that prairie as it was 200 years ago. Assume you have no budget constraints. Also assume you cannot buy the prairie, but rather you have to create your own. As you think about how you'd approach the problem, jot down the key steps to your solution. If you're like most people, 
at least our friends, you probably came up with a list that is something like this. Step one, buy a plot of land where prairie likely thrived in the past. For example, on the outskirts of Chicago, O'Hare. Step two, check the libraries, look for old photos of the prairie, obtain the most complete list available of all the plant and animal members of a prairie ecosystem. Step three, collect samples of all the relevant species, e.g. seeds of plants and male-female pairs of animals. Step four, clear the plot of land and plant your seeds along with a few trees. Step five, release the animals into the plot of land. Step six, watch and wait. Perhaps you added a few other steps with more intervention like fertilization or watering, but overall you likely suggested some kind of approach that we will loosely call assemble. That is, the steps you listed were to clear out your workspace, get the component plants and animals, lay out the blueprint, follow the directions, and start assembling. You could then piece together the various components of the prairie and hope that somehow a prairie emerges. The approach is quite reasonable. It seems intuitively correct. If you were assembling a car, a house, or a toaster, it would probably work. All you'd have to do would be to assemble the components of the desired system on a reasonably attractive plot of land, and eventually a prairie would emerge. It makes sense, right? Wrong. Assembly doesn't work, at least not for a prairie. A prairie is something that grows. It has to start small. It has pieces that interact and build on each other. Once it's up and running, the prairie works as a complex system that is dependent on the intricate interaction of all the components of the system. A prairie cannot be brought to life with one abracadabra, one wave of the magic wand. Ecologists have, in fact, experimented with trying to grow prairies. Early experimenters took the assemble approach but they ran into complications. Urban weeds are one such complication. Relative to most prairie species, these noxious weeds are aggressive and fast-growing. Given a chance, these tough weeds will muscle out the more timid prairie species and prohibit them from thriving. Knowing this, early ecologists began their work by clearing their field of weeds and then planting prairie grass seeds. Then the prairie flourished, right? Wrong. The prairie never emerged from these cleared plots. What happened? The problem with this logic is that the first plants to sprout and grow in a freshly cleared field are the most aggressive, fastest-growing weeds. So even though the prairie seeds were planted first, the urban weeds, weeds took over the cleared soil, and the prairie never took hold. Skipping a little bit here and continuing. In later experiments, ecologists extended the grow, not assemble approach. In particular, in one successful experiment in Illinois, ecologists grew a prairie savanna, a prairie with trees. They began by planting a sample of choice prairie savanna weed, seeds in a wooded weed-filled fields on the outskirts of Chicago. And then they described, the authors describe how it started to work. Butterflies came back that were classic with savanna, and it continues. As the experiments continued, ecologists learned more lessons about recreating prairies. They learned that order matters. Reversing the introduction of one species in another, e.g. reversing the order of entry of two predators, alters the ecosystem that emerges. Adding or subtracting of a species also alters the system, affecting its final states and its resilience to change. Perhaps the most subtle lesson to learn was that not all of the essential agreed ingredients to growing a prairie savanna are visible at the end. Ecologists learned this lesson when they were stymied in their efforts. They were close to creating prairie, but something was not quite right. Half-breed prairies were being created, a mixture of prairie and non-prairie species, the experiments didn't seem to be capable of evolving into that final step of a pure prairie. The ecologists searched for key components of a prairie that might be missing, but this was the whole problem. They were searching for something that they thought should be there but wasn't. Instead, ecologists should have been looking for something that had been there but did not stay. In other words, a fleeting member of the prairie system, a missing link. Was there a missing link that was not present in the mature prairie but was essential to growing it? Yes. That missing link was fire. Initially, ecologists failed to introduce fire into their experimental prairie systems because its presence is not explicit in the final product. It was not an immediately obvious candidate to be deliberately added. Moreover, although ecologists were trying to mimic nature and minimally manage the fields of emerging prairie, the incidence of wildfires was far lower than it would have been in a true natural setting. Without fire, ecologists could not create the elus elusive purebred prairie, Fire triggers certain prairie seeds to sprout and eliminates many fire-intolerant urban plants. Without fire, there is no prairie. I'm going to stop there. There's more. The rest is also interesting. I'll try to get a PDF of the whole thing up soon. But And I apologize for the length of that, but I think it's – obviously, it's important for a lot of topics we talk about here on Econ Talk, economic development, education – 
uh, many, many times this, this issue of order and assembly versus emergence and growth comes up. So I want to ask you, Pete, sorry for the long delay, but I want to ask you, how is the American Prairie Reserve going to deal with this issue of trying – it's a mix, it sounds like, of assembly and design along with letting stuff emerge. How are you going to solve that challenge? Well, there's a couple of uh, differences that give us uh, an advantage. So first off, the area in which we're working, 95% of the native prairie still exists. It hasn't been tilled, modified, plowed up, et cetera. So you start out uh, from a much more advantageous position than, you know, having to go out and clear land and start to grow things. And one one very interesting thing about the prairie ecosystem is most of the biomass is six or seven feet underground. So indeed, all the all the stock of the original biomass in our area is still there. It's just been grazed quite intensely. And what that means from a emergent order biodiversity uh, ecology perspective is that it's homogeneous. So cattle graze things fairly uniformly. And what we're trying to reintroduce is the heterogeneity that comes from having a uh, a grazer like a bison, which moves across the landscape completely different than cattle uh, in terms of its preference for individual prairie plants and such back on this landscape to create that diversity that I think aids in emergent order. Then there are a couple species that are still there, although almost in uh, ecologically insignificant numbers that are key to the uh, uh, emergence and su sustaining of the prairie ecosystem. One are the prairie dogs. So uh, we have these pieces already in place. We can bring them back where we don't have them. And what we see, at least in our limited experience over a relatively short time from an ecological perspective, is uh, fairly good results with letting the prairie sort of go back to what it was. Fires I mentioned earlier and is referenced uh, quite correctly in that uh, piece that you read is uh, a critically important uh, dynamic to get back into this ecosystem, and, and we will do that where we can do it responsibly. But there is this challenge of uh, how would you know how much fire to bring and how wide it should be and – Right. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, this is this is a challenge that that uh, you know every uh, every manager of any particular ecosystem faces. You can't uh, you can't get today back to what we think the historic frequency is of fires, which on the prairies was frequent. So there was a very short interval between fire and uh, the, the the fires there were responsible for the rejuvenation of the grasses and the creation of these very very patchy landscapes so for example when we burned a thousand acres three or four years ago our entire bison herd which is about 150 animals and two weeks after the burn were on this burned area eating the shoots and sprouts and going you know going poop on the ground and all that so and trampling in their their uh, feces their manure so you get this synergistic effect and the the only honest answer is you can only do this on a very limited scale. You know, we, we're not talking about going back to the Pleistocene. Uh, we have people on this landscape. We have neighbors. We have to be respectful of their property rights. So, you know, you can only do so much in any particular ecosystem and do the best you can with what you got. Has anybody talked about going back to the Pleistocene? <laughs> Woolly mammoths, saber-toothed tigers. Let's really get some serious predators out there. Yeah, so we've found some dinosaur bones yeah. on our uh, property. We could extract DNA, I suppose, <laughs> to Jurassic Park. <laughs> well, I was talking when I was preparing for this interview last night. I was telling uh, my wife about what I was going to be talking to you about, and one of my kids overheard us and said, uh, "Sounds like Jurassic Park." I said, "Yeah, it could be. Who knows?" <laughs> um, so let's talk about the political economy of of this a little more in a little more detail. And I, it's like as I said, is I think you talk about on the website it's a hybrid model uh but let's talk about the standard model which is a national park and as i confessed in a previous episode i, I happen to like most national parks um in the united states although uh we have to be realistic about how they are run they are run i think we have a romance that they're run to create uh some sort of pristine natural state but because of the issues you're talking about, because people wander all over them and because they have neighbors, they really aren't run that way. They're run as political institutions to a large extent. 
uh, or at least a better way to say it might be that the political realities interface with the biological imperatives or desires of the people who run it. And so, for example, to take a classic example, um, Yellowstone National Park, which is considered our, our, uh, our jewel, and I think you and I have both been in it together. I'm pretty sure mm-hmm. we have. Uh, we've hiked there. It's magnificent. It's beautiful. You see elk. But for a long time, you didn't see any wolves because they killed them all. And one of the reasons they killed them is that they wanted the elk population to be bigger because elk are really beautiful and they don't hurt anybody. Um, and wolves are scary to some people. And so they ran it a little bit. I, maybe I'm being unfair, but they kind of Disney-fied, as the way I think of it, the park. They made it more of a, of a theme ride and less of a real, true nature red in tooth and claw. As a result, there was terrible damage to the ecosystem, huge erosion and destruction of grass by the elk population because it went far beyond its natural size. Uh, But all that was because it was politically attractive to make it a safer place. At least that's the way I read it. Do you read it that way? Yeah, generally, I think you've got that right. And again, uh, critical difference between what we'll try to do and what uh, parks like Yellowstone face is the incentive structure they get from uh, the, the, the lack of feedback via the incentive structure they get to to operate the parks to provide things that people want. So until very recently, for example, uh, most user fees or gate fees at Yellowstone went back into the federal treasury. So there's very little incentive for Yellowstone to respond to its customers, its visitors, if you will. And so the allocation of resources is a political allocation of resources. And you see uh, all sorts of pathologies that flow from that. So bathrooms don't get fixed and sewage overflows in places like Glacier National Park and the infrastructure just gets uh, run down because that's not a politically favored uh, thing to do. So our model, I think, is just a a fantastic hybrid of that. We figure we have to raise somewhere around $500 million to buy all the land and create an endowment of about $125 million to make sure this park can run sustainably over time because we are uh, we think that, that we'll be sort of the third big national park, uh, Glacier, Yellowstone, and then the American Prairie Reserve, and people will come to it, but certainly people will not come in large enough numbers that we can uh, sustain the operations through the gate receipts, if you will. Uh, and having a nonprofit entity which is managed by a board which has to work very collaborative, collaboratively with these federal public agencies but really is a, is a private outfit strikes me as a fantastic uh, alternative to, to the national parks. And one of the reasons we're so enthusiastic about our project is Uh, I can't imagine the federal government going out anywhere today and saying we're going to put together a landscape that's one and a half, again, times the size of Yellowstone, three and a half million acres the size of the state of Connecticut. just doesn't seem to me in this era era of huge fiscal uh, constraints and and, uh, federal debt that that's going to happen anytime soon. Yet here we are out there making this happen uh, well beyond proof of concept. Now the only question for us is how fast we get to the end. Is it uh, 10 years? Is it 25 years? Um, so it's just a fantastic hybrid to be involved in. Well, let's talk about the the political economy that you're going to face. So uh, the other issue at Yellowstone, of course, is fire suppression. So we've talked about this metaphor also, which I think is very powerful, which is if you suppress every fire, um, you eventually get such a large buildup of underbrush and growth, uh, growth of smaller kindling that a fire comes along, you can't put out, you can't suppress, and you get a um, a really horrific fire, which is which what happened to Yellowstone. How are those incentives going to be different for you, uh, for the American Prairie Reserve? How are and I, we should I should mention wolves were reintroduced in, into Yellowstone in the last I think what fifteen years or so, mm-hmm. and they've been somewhat successful. You know they've they've culled some of the elk herd, the sicker, uh, less healthy animals. Uh, how are you going to deal with that when your wolf population gets bigger, when your grizzly bear population gets bigger, and you've got these people coming through to see this beautiful ecosystem? Uh, how are you going to respond to those incentives? How are you going to interact with the state of Montana to let things be, quote, more natural maybe than they would be in a natural park? Mm-hmm. Or, is that un- or is that unrealistic? 
No, it's not unrealistic. There's, um, if we talk about fire and wildlife separately for a moment, I think that's a good way to discuss this. So again, starting out with wildlife, it's important for the listeners to understand that we don't own uh, wildlife. And so de facto, we do not control their numbers. The way we influence wildlife to to have grizzly bears, and people may never see a grizzly bear on American Prairie Reserve, I just don't know, but wolves, elk, antelope, all these sorts of creatures is to make sure that we have a big enough landscape um, that we can tolerate these uh, these these wildlife numbers and and work with the state to make sure that there are uh, to the extent we can we re- reduce the conflicts with neighbors. So that's the whole sociology that we talked about with the wild sky. That's a very nascent early step. We'll have lots more projects over the next decade to continue to try to change that dynamic and increase the social caring capacity for wildlife. So again, we won't manage those animals. Grizzly bears, for example, on the public lands that we lease and wolves are going to be available for public hunting. Uh, And we can influence the hunters on our deeded lands, but on the lands we lease from the federal government and the state, we can't. Our bison herd growing to 10,000 animals, we think it's totally appropriate that we'll invite uh, hunters to take a few of those animals every year as we get these numbers bigger and bigger and bigger. So you, again, in in Montana, hunting is a very important part of the culture. It's one way to manage the wildlife numbers. In fact, it's the way the state manages wildlife numbers. Um, And our job, again, will have to have a big enough area so that we reduce potential conflicts between humans and wildlife. Regarding fire, we'll put as much fire on the landscape. We have quite a detailed fire fire management plan as we can without, again, violating the property rights of our neighbors. So we're going to have acres that are uh, very deep inside the core of the reserve that are far away from uh, other property owners where we can get a considerable amount of fire back on that landscape. And we'll do that as conditions allow over time. And again, the idea is to reintroduce a very dynamic force that helps this ecosystem sustain itself and be healthy over time. And it's a force that we know needs to be back on that landscape and we'll put it back to the extent possible. So another feedback loop that's in the political process is the tourists who come obviously benefit other people there in Montana who aren't part of the Prairie Reserve. And those benefits will in turn get some kind of voice in Montana if it's considered a, if you ruin it, if some if political decisions start to hurt the prairie, uh, there can be, a, we hope, of some sort of interest uh, on the ground to, to speak up on behalf of, of keeping it as it is. I guess I have it. So I want you to react to that. But also I'm thinking in the back of my mind of this beautiful, beautiful idea of the prairie as Lewis and Clark saw it. Um, Given that you don't control the wildlife directly across the whole space of it, what are the odds you can get there from here? Um, So talk about those challenges. Yeah, I mean those are those are real challenges which we are completely realistic and wide open about. And again, we think that as we become a bigger land over owner over time, the possibilities and the opportunities to grow this wildlife just increase and get easier and easier. We're perhaps at the hardest phase of this right now. When your listeners get a look at our property map, you see that we butt right up against the Charlie Russell National Wildlife Refuge. This is a million acres that is uh, devoted by congressional mandate to uh, wildlife. And it's one of the most wildlife rich parts of this part of the state. So there's uh, simpatico landscapes all around us and federal land management agencies with a biodiversity imperative that we think we can build on in a very synergistic way. There is no question that um, when you're dealing with uh, federal public lands, you're dealing with lands that are in fact political lands. Uh, that That is the reality of that. And, and we understand that and we don't ask for any special favors. And I think that works very well in our favor. Monkeying around with the uh, Bureau of Land Management, which manages some 280 million acres in the lower 48 that excludes Alaska is a tricky thing because what you do if, if let's say there were an administration that were out to get us per se, uh, 
and then they'd have to do something similar across uh, the rest of these lands. It's uh, these these federal public lands are like a huge ballast that works for you and against you. So I feel fairly confident that we're going to be able to achieve these wildlife uh, and biodiversity goals over time. Um, one area that we haven't talked about that's critically important is the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation, which butts right up against some of our lands right now. This is another op fantastic opportunity to engage uh, the American Indians, which we do a, a very good job of. It's very difficult uh, to not only provide some sort of glimmer of economic opportunity to a place that's impoverished beyond which most of your listeners can imagine, um, but to help those folks achieve some of their cultural goals, particularly vis-a-vis -vis bison restoration. So the landscape out there is, I think, fertile in the sense that there are lots of uh, constituents that would like to see the wildlife come back in an abundance that um, you know is not there now, but everybody knows could be there. And again, it's about working in the right landscape. So we're working in a place where people are generally have been moving away from for a very long time. So the opportunities look uh, reasonably good to me, as reasonably good as uh, anywhere else in the world. In fact, to to get this project done. I ask you a question about the tourism and the opportunity for people to visit. Uh at some point down the road, you can visit now, right? There's mm -hmm. there places yep. to stay. You can uh, camp, you can bike ride, but they're very limited, obviously. And, and you and I in the past have talked a lot about this issue with national parks. I mean, national parks are, you know, pristine, but they're full of people driving mm -hmm. their cars. And, and, uh, you know, I love when people complain, they see other people uh, when they're hiking or something. And I'm thinking, but that's mm -hmm. you, <laughs> you're, you're yeah. other people's other people. Yeah. Um, how are you going to control – and let me just – one more piece of, of background. The national park model typically has a, sort of a central area in the case of Yosemite, for example, which is one of my favorite places in the world. Uh, you have the Yosemite Valley, uh, which is an unbelievable place to just walk around. Uh, you can drive. You can – you don't have to do anything wild when you're there. You just get out of your car and look up, and you see some unbelievable – waterfalls and, and granite faces and, and just an extraordinary landscape. But the truth is the valley of Yosemite National Park is is not nothing wild about it at all. It's full of campers and camping and people with stoves and mm -hmm. screaming and bicycles and it's not there's nothing there's nothing wild about it. And most parks have done that. They take a sort of centralish area, they concede that it's nothing wild about it and they make that sort mm -hmm. of the the central place and then if you you know the great thing about Yosemite is if you walk if you're willing to walk other than Mist Trail if you walk pretty much lots of other places you don't see very many people it's pretty mm -hmm. wild and if you get a little farther out it's you feel very wild it feels like it looks like it's the way a person would have seen it hundreds of years ago at least in in many of its aspects how are you going to solve that problem or how are you going to deal with that issue of human interaction with the landscape when you have a three and a half million uh, acre park? Are you going to have – is there going to be a – there's no real obvious – there's no Old Faithful. There's no uh, Half Dome. There's no obvious, I don't think. There's no place. shelling point. <laughs> there's what? Yeah, exactly. There's no shelling point, right? Exactly. So, so yeah. how yeah. how are you going to give yeah, people very, access very good, to this? Yeah, very good question. And again, for your listeners to understand, um, of the three and a half million acres that we've got when we when we're all done with this thing, only five hundred thousand are going to be private, where we actually control access. The rest are going to be federal, public, and state lands, which have their own use regulations. Certainly, we'll be able to influence what happens on that, but. Uh, you know, uh, this is this project is about public access. We want to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place so that people can come out and enjoy and learn about the prairie ecosystem. Since we're so early in the project and we really don't even know what the final outline of the American Prairie Reserve project looks like, because again, it's going to be based on properties that people are willing to sell to us. Uh, the infrastructure, the master plan that we have uh, going on right now, what we're doing is talking to people uh, like the former superintendents of Yellowstone and Grand Teton and uh, Yosemite. We get them on the phone 
uh, once a quarter and we talk about these very issues. If you had to do this all over again, what would you do? And what we're the way we're thinking about it right now, and this will quite frankly be someone else's problem to deal with, the way we're thinking about it right now is sort of in concentric circles. So you mentioned you know, Camp 4 in, in Yosemite where there's a convenience store and a 7-Eleven and all that yeah. kind of stuff. And it's an urban experience, I get an ice cream. I get an ice cream. Yeah, I can play exactly. video games if I want. I get Wi-Fi. Right. It's, yeah. yeah, there it is. And then you go out these concentric circles and you get into ever more layers of wildness. So when you're 25 miles from the, the 7-Eleven in Yosemite, you're pretty much in the back of beyond and you're not seeing people. American Prairie Reserve will likely operate in much the same way, there will be different areas of use. So in this particular area on our data property, you can drive your RV. On this particular area, it's gonna be walk-in only because there's sens sensitive wildlife species, you know, nesting birds, whatever. There's gonna be this blended landscape of various visitor experiences. So uh, the, the other thing that's very interesting about our place is it's out there. It's in the middle of the nowhere. We're not unlikely to have, you know, Yellowstone, I think had 3 million visitors this year, unlikely to have those kinds of numbers. It, it's a geography, unlike Yosemite, which bottles you up in this great glacial valley. You can disperse people across this landscape in all sorts of different ways. And we'll put in, you know, we're talking about putting in a hut-to-hut -hut system so families can come out and walk, hike, drive part of this and come to places where they have shelter and cooking facilities and those sorts of things. And we'll likely have uh, much nicer visitor experiences where, where we have concessionaires who are running the equivalent of the Lake Hotel in Yellowstone for us. And then we'll have dispersed backcountry uh, recreation where people are out. We don't even know about it on, on their mountain bikes with their tents and stuff, and they're going for a very different experience. So uh, it'll be a real melange of opportunities for people to enjoy this uh, this fantastic landscape. But as you point out, there's no uh, obvious. I mean, Bozeman. Where's the, what's the closest city right now? The closest town is Malta, which has uh, an airport, uh, not a commercial airport, but an airport you can land, uh, you know, jets in. That's 50 miles away. It's about uh, oh, 3,500 people or so. And down in in the area in which we work, there are probably less than 250 people in a landscape of hundreds of thousands of acres. It's just a, a very remote, off the grid, no paved roads, gravel uh, kind of experience. And um, that's one of the reasons why we're working out there is it, it is so remote and, and there are very few people. So I'm kind of excited about this for a lot of reasons. I, I like wildlife. Um, as an economist, I really love the private innovation, the creativity of it, the entrepreneurship of it. I know you do, too. must be incredibly exciting to be part of it. Uh, but for the average person, you might say, you know, who cares? Who, you know, what, what's the big deal uh, if I never go there? And if it's – and it may be – I like to make a contrast between um, – uh, the San Diego Zoo, which is a very critically acclaimed zoo and other zoos. San Diego Zoo is really cool because the animals are – they try to put them in their own habitat. As a result, you often don't see them. Uh, when I went there, I didn't see that many animals. Uh, Disney, their uh, their zoo in uh, in Orlando – what's it called? I can't remember the, the name of their – um, in uh, Disney World, they have their own animal – Animal Kingdom, that's what it's called. I mean, you see the animals are everywhere because they know mm -hmm. that's what you come for. Mm -hmm. So in this experience, you know, may, maybe you might see a wolf. Maybe you won't. You'll see some bison. Uh, but it won't be maybe as exhilarating as as you might hope. So I'm just sitting here thinking, what's well, why do I care about this? So give me your elevator pitch. Why is this project important? Why should I care about it if I'm listening? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Um, the reason that I'm so excited about this project is this is one of the very few opportunities I think left in, in the world to put together a large landscape and then uh, have the opportunity to create a semblance of what was. And again, uh, in our fast moving 21st century, if you come out on the prairie, and I hope you will, and I hope lots of your listeners will as well, you have an opportunity to be totally unplugged 
in a landscape that's inspirational and powerful. It's an opportunity to get away and be quiet and reflective. And we hope to see wildlife that uh, just quite literally knocks your socks off. Unlike the, you know, Animal Kingdom at Disney where you're sitting in your car along this, this guided track and, and there pops up a zebra. And then and you're there pops pretending up you're, you're having exactly. a wildlife experience. Yeah, you know, we don't make those claims. It's uh, an aesthetic experience for some people. It's the, the notion that we're putting together a place where an iconic animal like bison, which used to roam this country from, you know, literally California to Washington, D.C., uh, can can operate naturally. We, we don't manage them. We don't push them around. Uh, they they run as wildlife uh, across a landscape, again, that provides people an opportunity to see something that's uh, vanishing and uh, and ties in with you know what Ken Burns called in his National Park series one of America's best ideas this whole notion of conservation Yellowstone the world's first national park in 1872 which is sort of a mind blower to think about what America looked like then and and we're f- putting these uh, these large landscapes aside so it's a, it's an American thing conservation is largely an American phenomenon where we lead the world and provide inspiration and I think what we hope to be as a model for people all over the world uh, to, to see that you don't need to wait for the federal government to do things. You don't need to lobby Congress to to be able to get these meaningful, not little postage sites, parks put together, but with private entrepreneurship and, uh, you know, the right people who have a business perspective and can get things done. You get that team together in a landscape where you can do it and, and you can make meaningful conservation gains even in this day and age. Puts a, put a little bit of wildlife aside for future generations. My guest today has been Pete Gaddis. Pete. Thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Yeah, my pleasure, Rush. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.